Hola a todos, estamos en el pabellón de América Latina y el Caribe organizado por CAF en la COP28 en Dubái, Emiratos Árabes Unidos, donde conversamos con referentes sobre las oportunidades y los desafíos que supone la acción frente al cambio climático desde una perspectiva de la región. Y hoy eh, nos acompaña Jeffrey Satch, eh, profesor de la Universidad de Colombia, director del Centro para, la, para el Desarrollo Sostenible de dicha universidad. Así que la siguiente conversación, les aviso, va a ser en inglés. Profesor Jeffrey Satch, thank you so much for joining Muchas us gracias. here. Muchas gracias. usted? <laughs> you were perfect. <laughs> so, uh, well, I mean, I read your last opinion article uh, about COP28. And you mentioned COP28 must represent the start of climate finance justice. What could be different this year in order this to happen? Because we have been here that rich countries are going to mobilize uh, finance uh, for the developing world and it's 2023 and that uh, didn't happen. Yeah, don't trust rich countries, but, <laughs> but tax them. That's my philosophy. So we need a global tax on carbon emissions, both the historic emissions for historical responsibility and the current flows, the rich countries should pay a certain amount for each ton that they emit. It's pretty simple. Not to beg these countries, oh, you have to honor your commitment. We should tax them. Uh, and this is my proposal. Right now, the rich countries emit roughly 20 billion tons of carbon dioxide each year, put a $5 per ton tax on those emissions. That's a hundred billion dollars right there. And that's easy for the rich countries to do because they are $50 trillion dollars in output each year. So $50 billion dollars or a hundred billion dollars, they'd barely even notice, but they're so greedy, they don't want to give it. And then we ought to tax the historic emissions, because that's the responsibility for the damages right now. So the good news is that a new losses and damages fund was finally set up. The United States gave something like $17 million. dollars. Are you kidding? <laughs> the country that caused one fourth of all the emissions in the industrial history gives $17 million dollars when we're losing a hundred billion or two hundred billion a year minimum to climate disasters. So they need to pay a tax. This is basic. I think that if we charged even 10 cents on each ton of past emissions, 10 cents, the United States would owe about 40 billion a year. The rich countries as a whole, probably uh, around a hundred billion a year for their share. Then we were starting to talk about real money. So when the United States representatives come here and they say voluntary carbon market or things like what John Kerry has said, no, you got to pay. You have responsibility. You're part of the world. And this is what we really need to move to. And one, what changes, uh, because it looks really easy in, in your explanation. It is easy. But, but they are not doing. Of course they're so not doing how, it. How things can change, I, I don't know if it's some uh, modifications on UN system on, or, or even in the international finance architecture. We need more and more for all the countries of the world to be together and to hear the truth. Uh, and uh, no more baloney because we're really in the climate crisis right now. And no more talk about this hundred billion because that's not even remotely enough for what we need. And they couldn't even accomplish that, the rich countries. If you leave it in a voluntary way, forget it. We need to move to real global taxation of CO2 and greenhouse gas emissions. Will it be easy? No, the United States will kick and scream. Nobody likes to pay taxes. Everybody likes to evade their taxes. Will it happen at COP28? No way. But could it happen at COP29? Absolutely. At COP30? Absolutely. Just don't let it get out of sight. We need to keep pushing. We need more countries to say this. We need there to be a global understanding. And in my discussions in this conference, I think 
uh, more and more governments around the world have the right message, which is we want to see exactly the line item in print. We don't trust you at all. Uh, we don't believe this hundred billion blah, blah, blah. We want to see the mechanism and we want to see it specifically and we want it in the bank. And that's what I heard this morning yes. in the discussions on I climate imagine finance. I you're there always, Mia Motley. I mean, I love how, how she speaks about, I mean, uh, of course. She, she, she sees every day the impact of climate change. Exactly. So we need to, this is the period where we're going to get the global financial architecture really fixed. The old global financial architecture was made Basically, after 1945, uh, the U.S. was so dominant and uh, a few good things came out of it, but a lot of not so good things. We need absolutely to modernize the global financial architecture. And in the meantime, and on, on that uh, change of the financial architecture, which could be the role of the private sector and the multilateral banks? The private sector certainly could be a major part of financing, but the problem right now is that private finance does not flow to the poorer countries very easily. There's a lot that needs to be fixed. Rich countries, they pay pretty low costs. Poor countries, huge costs. This is broken. And if you say go to the private sector, a very low income country might pay 15% interest rate on, on short-term borrowing. That's crazy. That will bankrupt them immediately. So we need to find mechanisms so that capital flows to all countries on the basis of their strategies, not on the basis of their income level. Right now, if you're rich, you get financing. If you're poor, you pay a penalty. And that system is based on lots of flawed ideas lots of bad design. Even the way the credit rating agencies work is completely out of date. By the way, even the way the IMF and the World Bank work is completely out of date. They need to, they, I mean. <laughs> they need, they need to create a system in which countries that are going to use the money properly get finance that they need because the returns, the financial returns on good investments is so strong it's the route to development you can't tell countries no you can't borrow or you can borrow but at 15 percent rate interest costs because then everyone's going to end up going bankrupt i would like to know a little about uh examples of good things that are are happening that maybe we are not seeing that uh, yet on climate finance um what could you share about some of the examples of sustainable production in the coffee industry? We're working with the COF on a wonderful project looking at coffee production in Costa Rica, uh, in Colombia and in Brazil. And the idea is to bring industry and the growers together to create sustainable development communities and improve coffee technology so that the coffee production is sustainable which is great because I'm a coffee drinker. I don't... I mean, I'm generally so imagine that I, I yeah, drink exactly. out of coffee So we day. need sustainable coffee. This is absolutely <laughs> clear from morning till night and for, you know, for years to come. And so the idea, what I found is quite strange. If you look at the major international companies, uh, and uh, I, I like these companies, they, they bring me my coffee each day. They don't have much connection with the farmer, actually. They just buy through a middleman, and they don't really even know necessarily what's going on at the farm. This won't work. We need the whole supply chain to be organized in a sustainable manner, and the big brands like Nestle uh, or other big brands need to be financing the changes on the ground in the smallholder farms where there are poor people that don't exactly go to a bank for a bank loan to finance the changes of production structure that are going to keep the coffee growing productive and sustainable even as the climate changes. At the same time, we can then use the UN systems and other and the COF and others to help the communities get the schools, the clinics, the roads, and the other things that they need, the things that a, 
a, a, a roaster or a, a coffee company wouldn't do. So we're trying to make a package deal where everybody benefits by creating a value chain that really is sustainable and robust and can uh, weather the ongoing climate change. Yeah, something with the, like the three pillars impact economically, socially, that's, and environmentally. That's exactly right. And you know, no single stakeholder can do it. Not the companies, not the smallholders, not the government. So the art of everything about sustainable development is how do you share the responsibilities and collaborate to make the whole supply chain or value chain uh, be sustainable. And that's what we're working on with the, a very innovative program of the COF. I don't know if he's a coffee lover as us. I guess he drinks a lot of mate. Uh, you work closely with an Argentine person that is admired around the world, uh, Pope Francis. Yes. Uh, Papa Francisco for, for us. Could you share about the last publication uh, in which you participate, which are like the key messages that you could share with us? We just uh, saw Pope Francis. He didn't come because of uh, yeah. his uh, infection, but he was on video in a meeting this morning with other religious leaders, uh, signing a shared document of religious leaders calling for climate justice and calling for global solidarity. And everyone had tears in their eyes because uh, he's so uh, incredibly inspiring and ennobling and helps us find a direction forward. And what he's been telling us since Laudato Si, mm -hmm. uh, and then Fratelli Tutti, and now Laudate Deum, uh, his most recent exhortation is work together for our common home and create new ways of responsible governance together so that the whole world can find solutions together. And he's all his messages recently are about the need for encounter, peace, and cooperation to solve these problems. And he helps to bring that message more than anyone else on the whole planet. And I think that's a good message uh, for people who are watching Absolutely. Uh, at home. So thank you so much. Uh, to be with you. With this conversation. Thank you. Eh, a ustedes los invitamos a seguir las redes sociales de CAF para conocer las próximas conversaciones sobre las oportunidades y los desafíos que supone la acción frente al cambio climático. Muchas gracias.